doing a series called Stay Tuned. Stay Tuned. And uh, saving the world, saving, saving the family. I started out with the world. Then I, I lowered my expectations and brought it down to family. And so let's save the family uh, within the hour. And so what we've been take, doing is taking some clips from some sitcoms, well-known sitcoms, and, and meshing them with the Word of God. And uh, we've just been having a good time. And as you can see, we're going to have some kind of object lessons up here this morning. And uh, We've been teaching on the family uh, this past week and, or this past month. And so uh, this morning we're going to continue in our series. So let's take a look at our theme scripture. We have a theme scripture for every time we bring a series. And so this is our theme scripture. If you have your word, you could turn to Deuteronomy 6. 5 through 9, or you could just look above me, all the translations I'll be using. Uh, we, use, we use various translations will be up on the screen. Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 9, this is in the Amplified Version. It says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and with all your soul and with all your strength, your entire being. These words, which I am commanding you today, y'all catch that? He's commanding us. He, he's not just suggesting it, and he's not um, uh, just, I'm going to throw this out there. If you want to, you, you'll pick it up. But he says, I'm commanding you that you shall, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and with all your strength. These words I'm commanding you today shall be written on your heart and mind, and you shall teach them diligently to your children. Notice it isn't it just about you. Right. It's not about you just following the, the word of God and you following what God wants you. It's about passing it down and passing it along. It says that you should teach them diligently to your children. Diligently. That's a great word, diligently, because we want to just, uh, we'll take you to church and hopefully you'll learn something in children's church. No, it's, it's, it's making it personal. You shall teach them diligently. In other words, parents, it should be uh, part of your job as a parent, to teach the things of God to your children, impressing God's precepts on their minds and penetrating their hearts with His truth. Can I tell you about this generation and can I tell you about society today? This is not a part of their agenda. Where God says, you shall impress it upon their hearts and their minds. You shall impress it. You, you shall... Uh, Give it to them. Let them hear about it. Let them see it. Today's world says that they should be able to do what they want to do. Right. Live like they... How many heard the Nimrod, I'm sorry, the person that doesn't know what they're talking about on Facebook that says, today, you should ask the baby if they want their diaper changed. Did y'all see that? Oh, my gosh. I'm not going to ask a baby if they... You stink. You, you, you are getting your diet, and you're supposed to read their body language. To if they, come on, they're not doing this because they're dancing. It's because there's stuff sliding around in there. I'm not going to ask a baby. I'm going to teach that baby right now that when there's something going on down below, that you're going to get clean. So when they're older, they're not doing this in church. I'm in a dancing mood because Lily was trying to teach me the, the floss dance. And I don't have enough screws loose in my body anymore. They're more rusted than anything. When I say I'm popping and locking, it's only because the joints aren't going anywhere. Look at this. It says to penetrate their hearts. It says, and shall speak of them when you sit in your house. Ooh, come on. When you walk on the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. I think that pretty much covers 100% of your life. Because we want to just tell about the things of God in the house of God. When we're in church, well, this is where we'll get our godly fix. But it says here, when you're in your own home, what do you do in your own home? What flies around in your house at your home? What are we teaching our kids in your home? It, God says it's not about just being in church. Because this shouldn't be the only church. You are the church. And so if we're going to live for God in just the church building, we should live for God in this church building. And it should try. You should be a mobile home for God. Some of us are a double wide, but that's okay. That's all right. We're a mobile home 
for God. You shall speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk on the road and when you lie down and when you get up. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and your forearm. And they shall be used as bands, frontals, frontlets on your forehead. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. That's saying that it's not only in the church. And it's not only in your home, but it's on the outside of your home. That when people come and visit you, they should see the things of God. This is telling me that God should be 100% part, not part, but all of priority in your life, in your family, in your kids, in your teenagers. It's not about a Sunday experience. It's about living for God 100%. I wrote this down, When kind of a a recap of that one scripture. When you begin to make God a priority in your family, God will begin to make your family his top priority. Amen? When we do and live the ways of God, God brings blessings into our home. For the past two weeks, we've been focusing on bringing value to the family and to our homes. In week one, we talked about home improvement. Uh, There's a message I brought, the importance of God's order and trusting him through the process. We talked about the three don'ts of home improvement. Last Sunday, Pastor Melissa brought a great word about growing pains, and it tied into what I was talking about, about going through the process and how it can be painful, but there's benefits to what comes out of it. Amen? But today I want to focus on the family, but I want to focus on you as an individual. Because how can we bring value to the family if we don't first see value in ourselves? You know, people want to get married these days, and they, nothing's wrong with marriage. God ordained marriage. It's it's his institute. He started it in the Garden of Eden. But we want to get married so young that we don't even know how to take care of ourselves, much less take care of somebody else. I was talking to a young man the other day, and and uh, he so impressed me when he, he told me that. He said, well, I want to make sure that I can support myself before I can support anybody else. And I was like, oh, I felt like Jesus. I have not seen so much faith as I've seen here today. I mean, it was so great. I was like, yes. And so, you know, if we could just get our young people to realize that, that it's important that you figure out who you are first in Christ before we start trying to mix with somebody else and helping them find out who they are. Look at this, in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, it says this, and we're talking about you as an individual. Didn't you realize that your body is a sacred place, the place of the Holy Spirit? Don't you see that you can't live however you please? Hmm. Squandering. I love that word. Squandering. That's an awesome Just everybody say it on three. One, two, three. Squandering. You got to, I don't know, there's something great about it. squandering what God paid such a high, high price for. Yeah. Don't squander it. What's squander mean? Waste it. Yeah. Just suck everything out of it and leave nothing to it. You're just, just squandering the things of God that he paid such a high price for. It's like if I went and bought a computer and brought it home and John Mark just started hitting it with a bat. And brand, what are you doing? You're squandering what I just paid for. And so we don't want to waste what is such, seen with such a high price. The physical part of you is not some piece of property belonging to the spiritual part of you. But God owns the whole thing. So let, so let people see God in you and through you. Let, him, let people see you completely sold out to the things of God. 100%. Amen. Ephesians 3.16 says this. May he grant you out of the riches of his glory to be strengthened and spiritually energized with power through his spirit in your inner self. That means uh, undwelling your innermost uh, uh, being and personality. I'm sorry, indwelling your innermost being and uh, personality so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through your faith. And may you, having been deeply rooted... And securely grounded in his love, be fully capable of comprehending with all the saints, God's people, the width, the length, the height, the depth of his love, fully experiencing that amazing, endless love. And that you may come to know practically through personal experience the love of Christ. 
which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience, that you may be filled up throughout your being to all the fullness of God so that you may have the richest experience of God's presence in your lives, completely filled and flooded with God himself. Amen? I want to bring you a message this morning called Full House. I want to get across to you today that if you will allow God, he will fill you to capacity in every single area of your life. We don't need to be Christians that walk around half full. We don't need to be Christians that there's just one area in your life that you are full of God and the rest are depleted. And so I want to bring you three points here today. Y'all know that I'm a points person, and I believe if you will uh, apply A, B, and C to your life, that you will get something out of what I'm talking about. But if we just want to look at A, and we don't want to look at B, or we don't want to look at number three, and those don't, uh, we don't think they apply to us, and, and I don't want to live that, that way. I'll live like number one, but I don't want to live like number three. You know, That's not applying the things of God to your life. And so I'm very um, basic in the sense of one, two, three, A, B, C, whatever you want to call it. But I want to give you three lies believed by believers. Three lies believed by believers in the message full house. If you look at the word believe, you'll see that right in the middle of the word believe is the word lie. You see it? It's the middle three letters of believe. Because God, uh, God wants you to believe in him. God wants you to believe in his word. God wants you to believe that you can be the best that he's created you to be. But the enemy's job is to put a lie right in the middle. Yeah. And if he can get you to believe a lie, he can get you to stop believing. And so I want to give you three lies believed by believers in this message. Number one, somebody needs to hear this today. There's a lie that the devil's uh, spreading around and you're believing as a believer that says you're not strong enough. That you're not strong enough. That's a lie that you're believing, that you're not strong enough. And we're going to go back to the scripture that we just read in Ephesians, and we're going to break it down within these three points. Number one, that you're not strong enough. Ephesians 3, 16, 17, the first part of 17, may he grant you out of the riches of his glory to be strengthened and spiritually energized with power through his spirit in your inner self, indwelling your innermost being and your personality. Innermost being and your personality, what is within you and what comes out of you. He wants to indwell in that. He wants to be a big part of that so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through your faith. Now, I have some things up here that we're going to illustrate uh, all three points here today, all three lies, actually. So the first one we're talking about is that you're not uh, strong enough. And you see here that we have pencils. And yes, Mom, I got these out of the children's department. I'll buy you some more. But... Um, I just do with what I got. Amen. So John Lee, come up here, my friend. Come on, you're going to help me out. And uh, we're talking about you're not strong enough. Now this together equals the church. Okay? Y'all see that? That equals the church. This is you. This is the EWC right here. Now together, we're unbreakable. Amen? Amen? Together, standing strong, we are unbreakable. Breakable. Now, I don't know how strong he is, so I'm not going to hand these to him because I don't want him screwing up my point. But I can't <laughs> break these all my strength. There's about 11 pencils in here, and together I can't. Come on, somebody. No matter what comes against the church and no matter what comes against the EWC and no matter what tries to bring us down, together yes. we can't break. But you know what? The devil doesn't work on the church as a whole. Amen? He doesn't come at us in a hole. He comes at us one at a time. Can you break it? God, I hope you can break it because you're really going to look bad if you can. Okay, and so he, this is one person in the church that he gets off by himself. He gets off and he starts whispering at him. He starts talking to him. He starts lying to him. And so they believe it. They believe a lie and they start uh, receiving what the enemy is telling them. And so the devil can easily break them. And so what the devil will do is he'll separate us one at a time, one at a time, one at a time, one at a time, one at a time. See, we're still strong. 
we're still strong. But if he can get us one at a time, just one at a time, one at a time, because he'll pick you, he'll talk to you, he'll lie to you, he'll whisper to you, and then before you know it, you, the, the, the one that really believes it will begin to talk to others, and before you know it, we'll start, we'll start everybody's just, what's going on? Where's, I didn't see uh, so-and-so this past Sunday, and I didn't see this person uh, so-and-so last Sunday. Where are they going? Where are they doing? Oh, and they invited this one, and they invited that one, and before you know it, the devil can easily destroy a church. Because he picks at him on a... Well, you know what I love? Thanks, sir. You know what I love about the scripture, Johnny? It says that God goes after that one. Why does he go after the one? I've always wondered that. It's always kind of been a mystery to me. Why would he leave the 99, Frank, and go after the one? Why would you leave the majority to go get the minority? Because together the 99 can stay strong. The 99 can handle it. The 99 won't go anywhere because they are strong and they won't be broken. God is concerned about the one that is by themselves. That can be broken. That's why he goes searching and looking. There's no shadow you won't light up. No mountain you won't climb up. He's coming after me. He's coming after you. He's coming after you. So he knows the 99 will be fine. But the one, the one. See, I don't know if y'all know, know, know much about lions and, and all that stuff, but the big cats that prey on things. Take a, a tiger. A tiger is hundreds of pounds. They're very big. They're very large animals. They're very fast. But the problem with it is as much energy as they burn off is how much food they have to eat. And so the tiger will not run after the fastest gazelle because the more energy it burns, the more food it has to capture. And so the tiger goes after the weakest because it's the less he has to run. So less energy he has to put out. And, and we want to say, the devil's attacking the church. The devil don't have enough energy to take us down. But if he can get the one, and he can get another one, and get another one, that's why, can I cannot tell you, we get the world has gotten us to the place where we have believed another lie, that church isn't important. Church is important. Because together... Well, I have my, me and my family, we're strong. And we say, you're still one. Yeah. And the enemy will still break the one. Right. But it's coming together as a family, as a church. Yeah. The devil can't destroy us. Amen. He can't destroy us. I wrote this down. The strongest person you'll ever meet is the one that admits they were at their weakest before they met Christ. Amen. See, it, it's, it's not about how strong you are. It's about how strong God's strength in you is. When I'm weak, come on, I am strong. When I am weak, I am strong. It, it's, it, Paul talks about it in his, in his, uh, in his, in his books when he, he talks about, I brag how weak I am. You, go, you see the guys at the gym, they say, oh, I pick things up and I put them down. You know, and you know, that's, you know, they're just walking so much they can't even put their arms down. Put your arms down you know, put them, and they're just, you know, because they're just so buffed and stuff. And they're, look how strong I am, you sissy girl, you know. <laughs> and they're like, where's the bathroom? And they're like, it, it's over there, you know, it's, a, it's around there, you know. And they're just, they just have to pose every time. And it's like they're boasting about their strength. Yeah. And see, as Christians, we can't boast about our strength because in our own strength, we're weak. And you might say, well, I want to be a Christian that says I'm strong and I'm strong. Let me tell you something. If you're constantly strong on your own, you'll never have need for the strength of Christ. And to say that we're weak isn't weak. It's saying that we have a dependence on a God that I know that can get us through anything. And I can't, I can't do everything. And I, I can't survive everything. And I, I can't handle everything. I have deficiencies. But through my God, I can do anything because it's his strength that overcomes my weakness.
us. Paul said in 2 Corinthians, what I was talking about, my grace is sufficient for you. My loving kindness, my mercy are more than enough. Always available, regardless of the situation, for my power is being perfected and is completed and show itself more effectively in your weakness. I like the message version. The message version said, my, my power works best in weak people. It says, therefore, I will all the more gladly boast. This is Paul talking. More gladly boast in my weakness so that the power of Christ may completely uh, enfold me and may dwell in me. So I am well pleased with weakness, which in, in insults was uh, I'm pleased with insults and distresses and with persecutions and with difficulties for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak. In human strength, then I am strong, truly able, truly powerful, truly dwelling from God's strength. Corey, can you handle that situation? No, but God can. Corey, do you know always the best thing to say? No, but God does. That's why he says, I am. I am. What do you need? Pastor Corey, what do you need? Pastor Melissa, what do you need? Brother Johnny, Sister Melissa, what do you need? What do you need? I am. Whatever you need. Because the more we let people know about his strength, the more it points to him when they realize, I didn't do it on my own. That's why I never boast and tell people, look what a great church I'm building. I'm building a great, God's building a great church. God's building great families. God's bringing, uh, growing great individuals in this place. It's God. But the devil will lie to you. He'll lie to you and say, you're not strong enough. And we can look back at him and say, you're right. But God is. God is. And it's through God that I can stand strong. Amen? Amen. Another lie is, you're not loved enough. That's a big one. That's a big one in today's world. You're not loved enough. We feel alone and we feel stranded. We feel orphaned. We feel like nobody cares and nobody loves us. You're not loved enough. Look, let's look at this scripture. Second part of that scripture in Ephesians 3, 17b, the second part of 17 and the first part of 19. And it says, And may you, having been deeply rooted and securely grounded in love, be fully capable of comprehending with all the saints, which is God's people, the width, the length, the height, the depth of his love, fully experiencing that amazing endless love. And that you may come to know practically through uh, personal experience. I love that, through personal experience. We could tell uh, people all day that God loves them, but there's something about when they personally experience it. When God moves in their life and they're feeling at their lowest and all of a sudden God swoops in and this, this, this love just overtakes them. And it, oh my gosh, I don't believe it. Or, or maybe that, that woman that's been through so many bad relationships time and time again and maybe they've been abusive or maybe they've, they've been uh, uh, verbally abusive, physically abusive. I don't know what it is that's going on in some people's lives, but I guarantee you that there will come a day where God will send the one that she says, I can't believe the love that I'm getting. It's because it's the love of God throwing, coming through a man for her. And vice versa for a man and a woman. I didn't know that marriage could be like this. I didn't know somebody could love me like this. As Christ laid down his life for the church and showed his love. The height, the depth, the personal experience of knowing what God does in us. The height, the depth. We can measure things. We can measure things in life. We, you know, all this stuff that we, I guarantee you, these things have been used all over this church. Sometimes we need more of a plummet to make sure they're straight. <laughs> they've, they've been measured, you know. And so, but, you know, it's, it's, it's an awesome thing because it's talking about if you could know the width. Yeah. Mm, the width. You know, we can measure some things. The, the width, the length, of the pulpit, the height of a pulpit. But what about the love of God? Because a lot of us in life, we, we think God only loves us so much. Yeah. Just so much. Come, come here, John Lee. Help me out again, bro. 
See, we, we want to, we want to, no, come down here. Come here. You got demoted. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So, you know, take that. Just, just go by Frank right there. Go by Frank right there. Some of us, we think this is how much God loves us. Some of us aren't even that sure. We're, we're, we're a little more closer right there. And we think this is how much. If you can measure the width, the height, the depth, the, you know, if you can measure the love of God. Can I tell you that you think he only loves you so much, but I guarantee you, I guarantee you, you can't measure. Keep going. Come on, come on, come on. God loves you. I said God loves you. God loves you. He lo- you can't measure it. Keep going. You can't measure It's so much that you can't measure the love of God. You can try it, but in your understanding, I guarantee you, you'll get to the place where you just can't comprehend it. He, he can't love me any more than that. This is 25 feet, 25 feet of, of man. He, he can't love me any more than that. My God, if I could get a hold of 100 foot, if I could get, I'd send John Lee out the door across the street, across town. I'd send him to the bayfront. And you still couldn't measure the love of God that he has for you, the depth, the width, the height. The, you can't do it. Because we only see it on a certain level. You can't imagine. How much I love you. The only best way I can illustrate it is he said, I died on a cross for you. I gave my life for you because past our humanity, we can't imagine anybody loving us more than laying their life down for us. That's the greatest love. Because we can't get past anything else. So what a demonstration to die on the cross for someone. Because that's the farthest our limits can go, brother. But you can't measure how much he loves you. I wrote this down. While the world will always base love on a fading feeling, God's love will always be based on an eternal action. It's all about Christ dying on the cross for you, shedding his blood for you. Romans 5, 8. But God clearly shows and proves his love for us by the fact that while we were still sinners, Christ died while you were still sinners, while I was still a sinner, while we were still living in our mess, doing what we, like that scripture said a while ago, you can't live like you want to live, but God still died for you. Christ still died for you, even when you were doing what you want to do. He laid down his life before your foot ever set, set on this earth, before your, your lungs ever sucked air. He said, I'm going to die for them because they can't even fathom why. I love them so much. Yeah. I've heard people say that God can't love me. I'm unlovable. I've done too many things. God says, I'll get them out of the way. I'll throw them. Come on, come on, somebody. As far as the east is from the west. And not only will I get them out of my sight, but I'll get them out of my mind. I'll throw them as far as the east is the west, and I'll remember them no more. Thank you, Lord. He loves you that much that you can't even measure the height, yeah. the depth, the width of how much he loves you. Amen. The devil will try to lie to you, though. You're not loved enough. Oh, I beg your pardon, Satan, because I can read in the word that says that he laid down his life for me. Amen. What did you do? What did you do? Amen. My God loves me. And so if you ever doubt and say, nobody loves me, everybody hates me, I think I'll go eat some worms. Y'all knew that was coming. That's a little song of the children. But, you know, it, it's, well, I, I just, I, nobody loves me. Nobody likes me on Facebook. Oh, my gosh, the world's ending. Nobody liked my comment or liked my picture, or said congratulations, and the balloons went, Pata! Does that scare anybody else? It scares the crowd out of me every single time. And, Because of that, we think nobody cares about me. God loves you. God loves you. And I'm going to be so bold to say there's people that love you too, but you won't let them. Because it's not on your terms. But if we learn to lay some things down and get out of the way, we'll find that some people actually care about us. But the problem is 
we don't find value in ourselves. And so we think nobody else finds value. And I guarantee you, men, women, teenagers, young adults, if you begin to find value in yourself, you'll bring value to your family. Because when we don't find value in ourselves, we become an obstacle. We become a, a, you know, a, a, an obstacle in the family. You had the, everybody's trying to work together, but, but you just are in this mood. Yeah. Teenagers. Oh, I'm sorry, did I say that? You know, we, we, <laughs> we want to act out or we want to be moody and we want to, you know, uh, uh, I'm not happy so the rest of the world will never be happy. <laughs> Paige was like that. Oh, my gosh, I about killed her. <laughs> How you take a teenager to the happiest place on earth called Disney World, and she's the only hap- not unhappy person there. I don't understand. I just don't understand. Thank you, God. She grew up, got married, and she's a wonderful person now. But, you know, <laughs> back, back in that time, back in that time, you know, teenagers, you know, get over yourself. Your parents love you. Right. Your parents care about you. Yeah. They brought you into this world for a reason. No, Daddy said I was a oops. No, you weren't an oops. God meant you to be here. God had planned for you. And your parents see the value of you. You are loved. Last one, a lie brought by the enemy is you're not filled enough. I think this is a big one in the church, Brother Johnny. You're not filled enough. And because you're not filled or full enough, you think you can't do anything for God. I like what Brother William said about Julie. I think that's such a great encouragement because just like her, there's a lot of y'all in here that you don't understand your fullest capabilities. There's more in you than you think there is. There's more that God wants to use uh, than you think there is. And if you learn to take just one step, you'd be like those balloons in Facebook. It's like, what happened? It's because you took a step. And God says, oh, 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 they want to be used. Oh, I was just waiting for them to take a step. I was just waiting for them to say, okay, I was just waiting for them to get in line. Now I can use them. See, you're filled enough. But the devil lies to you and says you're not. Ephesians 3, 19, the last part of that scripture says, it says that you may be filled up throughout your being to all the fullness of God that you may have the richest experience of God's presence in your life, completely filled and flooded with God himself. Filled, full, filled up. Every single area. You know, like Joey, oh, this is enormous, enormous, enormous. No. It's a big place. You know, let God consume you. Let me show you this last one. Come here, Johnny. This is the lie that the enemy gives us. Let me open that up. I want you to fill that cup up. Okay, so, okay, so we, 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 get, we come to church, right? We come to church and we, oh, 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 how great I am. You know, we just sing and stuff. That's not how Julie sings. But anyway, you know, we just sing and stuff. And so, you know, mountain you can climb up. No, 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 no. Doing all Cal Corey Asbury and stuff. You know, we get, and we get out of here and like, man, oh, I want to go. I want to go uh, preach to something. I want to go do this. And the devil lies to us, you know, that you just got filled. And then you go try something and there's nothing in you. There's nothing in you. But he said, man, I just, I just went to church. I just did this. I just did that. And, and where it is? Why, why am I feeling the devil lied to you? There's nothing in you. You can't offer anything. You don't know what the pastor talked about. You fell asleep halfway through it. You know, you don't know what God wants to do in you. And all these lies start to fill you. And where you thought you were filled, all of a sudden there's nothing in you. But can I show you, God, what God says, what God says about you, that you need to be filled, 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 that he wants to fill you up, fill you up. He wants to fit. He wants to overflow you. Come on, somebody. Just keep overflowing and just keep overflowing and just keep overflowing. God says, come on. I need some people that are ready to be overfilled, flowing, that they're dripping on people, that they're just getting everyone around them wet. Good. That's what God wants to do in you, yeah. that you have something in you to give. Don't everybody start running for the restroom. But you know, it's just, you know, it, that's how, that's what it's all about. That you have something in you to give out. 
And a lot of us, we just go, why? Why is it? Why is it? That doesn't happen to me. Why isn't anything coming out of me? Because you don't take time to put it in you. Well, Pastor Corey, you just preached an awesome, fantastic message. And oh, I want to post it all over Facebook so it's because uh, it's so good. Thank you. But <laughs> what did you do for yourself? How much have you been studying on your own? I love when William comes up here. My God, William, you pray. And I'm like, God, I'm the pastor. I should have thought of that. You know, it's so good. That's not what I think. I'm so proud of him. Because every time he comes up here, he just, bleh, wisdom all over y'all. <laughs> See, I thought I was going to say something spiritual. Like, oh, shun that. No, it's a, bleh. He just, he just does it. Why? Because this man takes time to put it in him so to come out. When we try to fill ourselves with the ways of the world, we will end up drowning in a pool of false expectations. Hmm. Because that's what we just want to... Oh, I came to church and I feel good. Oh, yeah. Pastor Pastor Corey saw me there. Yeah. Okay, good. Good. He saw me there. Okay. I'm good with him. Yeah. I took pictures in the foyer in the bathroom. Everybody knows I was at church. But what do we fill ourselves with outside? Yeah. Outside of this place. Uh-huh. The Bible talks about, you know, things that are holy, things that are pure, things that are good. What we fill ourselves with is what will come out of us. Yeah. With the ways of the world, we'll drown in a pool of false expectations. Let me read you this in closing. I want to recap with that scripture, Ephesians 3.16, that you are full, yeah. but you need to continue to fill yourself. Look at this, Ephesians 3.16, as we close. May he grant you out of the riches of his glory to be strengthened and spiritually energized with power through his spirit in your inner self, indwelling your innermost being and personality, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through your faith. And may you have been deeply rooted and securely grounded in love, be fully capable of comprehending with all the saints, which is God's people, the width, the length, the height, and the depth of his love, fully experiencing that amazing, endless love, and that you may come to know practically through personal experience the love of Christ, which far surpasses mere knowledge without experience, that you may be filled up throughout your being to all the fullness of God so that you may have the richest experience of God's presence in your life, completely filled, flooded, with God himself. Can I encourage you this morning and let you know that you are filled with his strength, with his love, and with his spirit. Amen? You are a full house. Allow God to consume every single area of you. You'll find that if you do that, you'll begin to see problems dissipate. (coughs) Things that have been getting in your way are no longer a problem. Obstacles are no longer staring at you in your face because you have allowed God to be the center of your life. Amen.